Thank you guys so much. If you have your Bibles, we can turn to uh, the book of Job, the book of Job. And uh, again, we are doing this series, The Winding Road of Providence. And uh, we uh, are doing Sunday nights a little bit differently than we do on Sunday mornings, where normally, typically on a Sunday morning, I will just open up a passage and, uh, and read through it and go verse by verse with a interpretation. But uh, on Sunday nights, we've been doing this series, The Winding Road of Providence, where we are not doing it quite like that. We're trying to answer some of the deeper, more philosophical questions about God's purpose in pain and suffering. And so uh, it seems like it's been forever since we were in here and having this discussion. And I guess that's true uh, because of my absence as well as uh, we had a, a children's night. We had a Sunday that was interrupted by weather. And, uh, and then Tim scared everybody off last week. So, uh, uh, But, uh, but uh, I'm glad to be back and I'm glad to be on to this subject tonight even though uh, it's probably the most difficult in this entire series, as tonight we are going to talk about the sovereignty of God. And uh, in order to do that, I want to just ever so quickly remind you that the first two weeks what we did was we looked at the nature and the character of God. We looked at how God is a good God. He's a gracious God. How God has a plan for our existence, and that is to bring himself glory and to bring us good through his providence. And that is not only those things, but that God is a sovereign God, that God is a holy God, that he is just and righteous. And even the worst parts of our existence, even the most difficult days, are all a part of his marvelous plan. And uh, the reason that he does those things that we will discover in the coming weeks is because God wants to transform us. He wants to make us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And we want to begin to really flesh that out tonight. But it is important to remember why uh, uh, or what we've discussed to this point. Because if you enter into tonight's discussion about God's sovereignty and the weeks that will follow without remembering that God is perfect and holy and just and righteous in all of the things that he does and that he has a great plan for your life to give you a future and hope, then tonight especially and the coming weeks can become, uh, what shall I say, a little bit uh, overwhelming. They can, uh, we can forget and lose focus on why it's so important to talk about the sovereignty of God, talk about God's rule and reign over creation. We can even get a little bit down in the dumps because we might start thinking that maybe God is like some giant kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass, right? We might misunderstand who God is if we even for just a moment forget that God is perfectly holy and righteous, that God is love itself, and that he has this great plan for us. Now, those things do not negate his sovereign rule over creation. And so tonight, we're going to have that discussion. And it's the most difficult of all in the series. But it is the discussion about what we believe about how God rules and reigns over creation. How does God govern the world? That's the question we want to talk about tonight. Scholars and theologians have been divided for centuries on that question, and I don't pretend that we're going to solve it in the next 30 minutes, but we're going to do our very, very best. But I want you to understand that that question, how does God govern over the world, is not merely academic. It is not just a question for preachers, theologians, and academics to sit around and discuss, because how you answer that question has very practical ramifications to how you will live your life. It's not theological babble that we're asking that question for tonight, but rather the way you answer that question has very practical implications to your response to the trials that you will experience in your life. For example, when your dad dies at 62, right, at a young age with no health problems, suddenly what you believe of God's rule and reign over his creation will govern, will have practical implications about how you respond to those things. Some have imagined over the years that God is like a great watchmaker. They, they believe that God has somehow wound up this great clock that we know as the world in creation, and that since that creation time, he has been sitting idly by watching that clock run out. 
The reason they have imagined God's governance over creation in such terms is because what they want to do is they want to keep God free from the problem of pain and suffering. They want to keep God free from the issue of evil in the world. And in so doing, what they have done is they've actually neutered God and his ability to rule and reign over creation. Some have imagined that God just set this world into motion and then just stepped back from it and began to watch as the world unfolds. But the the problem with such a theory is that if that is what God has done, then you and I, our prayer life is absolutely and utterly meaningless. Because God's not going to respond. He's just simply allowing the creation to fall apart and, 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 and run its course, and then one day he will step in. Others have tried to answer the question about how God governs over the world by assuming that there are things that God is, is unno, uh, as unknowledgeable about. Now, before you just throw that, that, that philosophy out right at the onset, I want you to understand where they're coming from. They suppose that God's only active and intimate in the most biggest decisions or certain stages of life. They believe that God wants to maintain the quote-unquote free will of man, and therefore he has acquiesced certain rights and privileges that are given to him, such as what we know as omniscience or God's ability to know all things. That view is called open theism, and it is an attempt to understand why difficulty and tragedy happen in the world, but still maintain God's ability to be holy. If God is ruling and reigning over creation in such a way that he is only involved in the biggest of situations or certain things and chooses not to know about pain and suffering, then God is somehow, in their view, uh, 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 somehow, uh, 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 how do I want to put this, absolved from the problem of pain and suffering. And at the same time, he allows for man to keep his, his standard, his free will, and not be able to blame God. Those who profess this view do not want to indict God on charges of injustice. And so they suppose that God is only knowledgeable and really active in the really big decisions and matters of life. But I ask this question to those folks, does a God who does not know everything somehow comfort your mind? Could you believe tonight in a God who chooses not to know certain things because it somehow acquiesces or he has acquiesced rights so that he is absolved from any injustice? Would you accept a God who chooses not to know certain things? Does it comfort your heart to believe that God chooses not to know certain things just so that he can maintain his holiness. I don't think either one of those views sounds like the God of the Bible, and yet they are the most prominent views that we see in evangelicalism today. For example, uh, the uh, Shack uh, book and movie are all out of this view of open theism, that God stands back and chooses not to know certain things. And the reason why is because if God doesn't know certain things, man is free to act, and he must simply only react in the big situations of life. But consider what the scriptures say about God. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3, for example, describes Jesus as the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The Hebrew writer said that Jesus upholds the universe. That is that he stabilizes it, gives it its sustenance, gives it its substance and strength and foundation by the word of his power. Does that sound like a God who chooses not to know certain things? Or Psalm 33 and verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. God created all things, the psalmist says, by a simple uh, 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 act of speaking. Or Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, speaking of Jesus, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, and listen to this last phrase, and for him. Does one really believe that God created the heavens and earth and everything contained within them as the scriptures say, but then abdicates his sovereignty, abdicates his rule over those things? How could he create this marvelous thing called the world and the solar systems and everything in between? How could he create those things and then just simply abdicate his governance, step back from them and say, well, you handle it from here? Does anyone actually believe that everything was made for him, Jesus Christ, but then God decided to just walk away 
and see what happens. Surely, beloved, tonight I want you to know that our God, my God, is much bigger than that. Our God, the God of the Scriptures, is much bigger than a God who chooses not to know certain things. He's much bigger than a God who winds up the creation and then walks away to see how it all unfolds. But I have to confess in a moment like this that when we ask this question, what is God's rule over creation, what does God's sovereignty really look like, the question itself is supercharged with emotion. Because on the one hand, if one is to say that God is actively involved in the affairs of man, then what are we going to do when there is suffering, pain, and evil? If we believe that God is governing the world by being actively involved, that is, he's not sitting on the sidelines, but actively involved, what do we do with pain and suffering? On the other hand, If we don't believe that God is actively involved, that he is just watching things unfold, then what is the point of prayer itself? If God did want pain and suffering, if God was actively involved, does that mean that he wanted pain and suffering in our lives? That's why the question, how does God rule over creation, is so supercharged with emotion and it's not just a theological babble. It's not just an academic pursuit. It has very practical and real applications. Did God want a 20-month-old to pass away? Did he have a purpose and a plan in that? Did God want a 62-year-old father who didn't have the chance to know his grandchildren Did he want him to pass away? Did he have a purpose and plan in that? If God is governing in such a way that he is active, what do I do with that? You see, at the onset, most of us want a God who is actively involved. We don't want a God who is sitting idly by on the sidelines waiting to see the world play itself out because that's not even God itself. That's more of a picture of man, isn't it? I mean, man is reactionary. That's the easiest way to ask the question tonight. Is God reactionary or is he preemptive? Is God before all things, as Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, or is God always behind all things, responding to them? Is God making lemonade out of lemons, or did God give the lemons to make the lemonade? That's the question. Is God reactionary? Is he sitting idly by trying to help make the best out of bad situations? Or is God actively involved? And if he's actively involved, what do I do with my pain? What do I do with my suffering? What does that say about God when those things happen? The reason we began in the first couple of sessions talking about with a discussion about who God is and his plans for me was because ultimately I knew that we were going to reach a crossroads in this winding road of providence. That every human experience is filled with a moment at this crossroads. Where as we approach God's sovereignty, as we ask the question about how God rules and reigns over his creation, we reach a crossroads where we have to make a decision about what we believe about God himself. Some will stay at this crossroads and ponder all of the ramifications of their beliefs. And I want to bring you to that crossroads tonight. Others, on the other hand, will say this is just way too deep. It's too much stuff. They don't want to ponder the ramifications. And so they will just leave the crossroads and they'll go back and forth all the time, being shifted around depending on what fits their circumstance. But the reality is that all of us, none of us, are spared from pain and suffering at some point in our lives. And so at some point in our life, all of us come to a crossroads where we have to answer the question in the midst of suffering, how does God rule and reign over what he has created? When I use that term sovereignty, you know what I'm referring to tonight. I'm talking about God's rule in creation. When a king rules over a nation, he is called a sovereign. When we speak about God's sovereignty, we are discussing how much power does God really have? How much rule does God really have over the universe? Do things happen by accident? Are we all a part of a massive series of coincidences, or is there some master plan that is being worked out? I think most folks within the sound of my voice tonight would say, well, we believe that God has a master plan even though we don't always understand it. 
Surely God does know some things in the world, but how much does he really rule and reign over? If God is too involved, wouldn't that negate man's freedom? If God really rules over Chris Guppy, then doesn't that negate my freedom and my responsibility to do what is right over what is wrong? How does God, who knows all things, allow man to maintain his freedom? One of my philosophy professors, he made it simple in college. He asked the question like this. He said, what is the difference between God decreeing a deer to run out in front of your car uh, tonight as you drive home and God allowing that deer to run out in front of your car on the way home? You see, if God has decreed that the deer runs out in front of your car on the way home tonight, what will happen? A deer will run out in front of your car on the way home. If God has allowed, has known about a deer that will run out in front of your car tonight on the way home, what happens? Not the same thing. So he said, what is the real difference? There's the question. This is why it's not just theological banter. It's not just babble. It has real implications, real application to how we view the world. If God is actively involved, If he's not just sitting back and watching events unfold, then why doesn't he stop horrific events like mass shootings in a school, cancer, and 9-11? If God is actively involved, if he's really sovereign, why would he allow such things, even permit such things, according to his will, to take place? I suppose you could summarize those questions down to a single one, though I'm sure that that same college philosophy professor would be very disappointed in me tonight. He would ask, is God reactionary or preemptive? In the most simple of terms, does God merely react to what he is watching, whether in the future or the present, or does God preempt every moment in history? There are a whole host of questions which follow depending on which answer you choose tonight. But many of those questions are, quite frankly, totally unanswerable. I want you to know tonight, I cannot give you every answer to a question. I don't have every answer to my own questions. I'm thankful tonight that my dad is in heaven rejoicing with the angels and singing the song of the redeemed. And yet I cannot understand or cannot comprehend, even at this moment quite yet, how God, how God can receive glory and how my children can receive good from an untimely death. Perhaps I'm drawn to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians and chapter 13 and verse 12 that he says that we view the world as though we were looking through a dim mirror or a faded glass in our present reality. That as we look at this thing called life, this thing we call the world, we are looking at it through eyes, through a wrong prescription. We are looking at it through a dim glass and a faded mirror. And so we're not getting a real view. And thus he says, only in heaven, when everything is revealed, will we have all of the answers that our heart longs for. I wonder if we'll really have all the answers that our heart longs for or whether those answers will seem so unimportant at that moment. But so that it does not dissuade us, however, to search the scriptures, there are some answers that are possible tonight as we talk about how much rule, how much control does God have over the universe. But I want to warn you, before we even get into this understanding, before we even look at Job, the king of suffering, we're getting ready to look at God's rights his rights, his authority with his creation. And when we do that, it is important that you remember from where we have come. One last time, each and every step down the road, the winding road of providence to this point has reminded us that as we look at God, we see somebody who is holy, 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 perfect and righteous in all things. God does nothing impure and unjust except to give us mercy. God never does something wrongly. God loves his creation. And not only that, we have seen that God has a great plan for his creation. So when we look at who God is, and as he claims his authority in Scripture, and as he ascends to his throne, we must not go down the wrong path and accuse God of unrighteousness. And we will see this play out. We must be mindful that God is pure and holy and righteous in everything that he does because he is pure and holy and righteous in his nature itself. If you would, turn with me to the book of Job, and we are going to move somewhat fast tonight. We have all heard the story of Job before and all of his suffering. And for those reasons, I call Job the king of suffering. 
But very few have actually taken the time to really search the truth that is captivated in his story, which I think is powerful. The story begins with an auspicious beginning. In Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, we learn of the impeccable character of this man called Job. Verse 1 tells us that Job was an upright man who feared God and, uh, and turned away from evil. Rightfully, we would expect such a man who is living in this way to be extremely blessed by God. And indeed, he was. We would think that somebody who always does what is right and shuns away from evil will be blessed by God. We learned that Job had seven sons and three daughters. You can determine whether that's a blessing or not. But we learned that his bank account was full with thousands of sheep, camels, oxen, and donkeys. And he also had many servants, which implies that he was doing pretty doggone good. He was wealthy, right? Job's character was so impeccable that he not only offered God sacrifices on behalf of himself, but you will notice that he offers sacrifices on behalf of his children. Apparently, Job's children, like many of ours, loved to throw big parties. And Job often worried that when they were at these parties, they might sin against a great and holy God. And so just to be safe, Job would offer a uh, sacrifice. He would intercede on behalf of his children. A great picture there, parents, for how we should operate with our children. He stands as the picture in verses 1 through 5 as a godly father, godly husband, a model citizen, and the man or woman, the person that all of us should strive to be tonight. We should all want to be like Job. We should be men and women of great impeccable character, great morality and righteousness as we are conformed into the image of Christ. But what we learn in Job chapter 1 is behind the scenes in heaven, there is a storm that is brewing over Job's head. Now, I should stop at this moment and say how you interpret Job is important as well. Is Job a real story? Is he a historical figure? Do these events really happen as they are described? Or is this some parable meant to teach us a lesson? If it's a parable, then we may not have to apply it literally. But I happen to believe that Job was a real person, and these events unfolded just as they are described in the Scriptures. Behind the scenes in heaven, there's a storm that is brewing. We are told in verse number 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God... Stop there for a moment. That phrase you will see in your reference Bibles or study Bibles is a Hebrew expression for the angels of God, God's messengers... So he says, now there was a day when the angels, God's messengers, are you ready, came to present themselves before the Lord, and listen to this, and Satan also came among them. The heavenly scene is laid out with Job unaware. Job is going about his business, doing what is righteous and right under the law. He is doing what is right by his family. But God's messengers have come before the throne, and they are coming before God, the writer says, to present themselves, which is a Hebrew expression to say that they were giving a report for what they had been doing. In other words, God's messengers, his angels, were coming before God on this day as Job was offering good sacrifice, and they were saying, this is what we've been doing. We have done what you have asked us to do. We have carried out your divine decrees. God was, as it were, having a performance review of his messengers. He was having a job analysis. He was understanding whether or not the people, the the messengers rather, the angels, were carrying out the business they were called to do. But it was not only the angels, we're told, who were there that day. You will also notice that there was with them Satan, the chief adversary. Isn't that interesting? That on this day, as the storm is brewing over Job's head in the heavenly places, the angels, messengers of God, are coming before the throne of God, and they are giving an account for what they have been doing on the earth, and with them comes the greatest adversary of man, the devil himself, Satan, there with him. God asked Satan a question. I like this question. He says, from where have you come? In other words, Satan, what have you been doing? What is it that you have been up to? What is it that you have been involved in? Isn't that interesting that even Satan in this moment, like all of the other messengers of God, was being called to give an account at the throne of God? 
He was being held accountable in this moment for his actions, to which Satan responded from going to and fro on the earth and from walking down on it. Satan was telling God in that moment what he had been doing. He had been wandering the world, he says, and we might presume to bring havoc upon mankind. This is where our theology hits a huge speed bump. Because it says next in verse number 8, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Er, Stop there. What in the world was God thinking? Have you considered my servant Job? When, 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 when Satan began to give an understanding, when he began to give a performance review of what he had been doing, when he was giving an account of his actions, God interrupts him and says, What about Job? Have you, have you seen him lately? Have you visited with him? He says, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? I wonder what was God thinking in that moment bringing Job to the attention of Satan. I'd just as soon he did not do that to me, right? I would just assume tonight that God did not say, Hey, I know you've been busy, Satan, but there's this little fella down there at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Have you considered his actions and considered how he is serving and worshiping me? I just want to bring him to your attention. No thank you very much, right? He tells God that the reason, Satan responds to the Lord, the reason Job is so upright, the reason Job is more righteous and holy than any other man in the world is because, he tells God, you have put a hedge of protection upon him. Further, God has, you have continued to bless the work of his hands. You've made him healthy and wealthy and rich, and you've given him everything that he could have wanted. Of course, Job, God, he would follow you because you are continually blessing him. But that's not the interesting part. You set the scene with me, right? The angels are giving an account for what they have been doing. Presumably, God has given them a mission. They have come back to the throne to report on whether they carried that mission about. Satan comes in and God asks him for his performance review. What have you been doing? And when Satan says, I've been walking around creating havoc, God says, have you paid any attention to my servant Job? He's really, really righteous. He's really, really holy. He's been doing all of the right things. And Satan responds back, of course he would be. You have done everything for him. The interesting part, however, happens in verse number 11. When Satan says to the Lord, But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Satan says, God, if you would but for a moment remove that hedge of protection and allow me to go and move in his life, I promise you, you won't think the same of Job anymore. Now, it would be easy to go past that really fast, but we better stop for a moment. What does that imply? Well, it implies that Satan had to ask permission before he could do anything. Beloved, I want you to know that we serve, or we serve a great God and we have a great adversary in Satan the devil. And in our churches, we have terribly misunderstood the power that he has. I want you to understand that Satan has a lot of power tonight. That he can destroy lives, that he can uh, uh, make lives so almost unredeemable except for the blood of Jesus Christ. He can just absolutely annihilate, kill, steal, and destroy everything about uh, mankind and this thing that we call life. But I want you to notice that when Satan says, if you'd let me do this, what he's saying in that moment is, do I have your permission? And that means that even though he is great in his scope of power and ability, he is on a leash tonight. He can only do as God gives him permission to do. That you don't have to get up on a Sunday morning and stomp on the devil's head. Did you know that? (laughs) You remember that movement? Okay, I'll leave that alone for a little while. You don't have to stomp on the devil's head because are you ready? God's got him on a leash. He can only do so much as God allows. Satan tells God that the minute God would trade all of Job's good things for bad things, surely in that moment Job will stop seeking him. And the implication is, would you give me that permission? By the way, beloved, that is also the ultimate test of faith. Can you praise God even when it doesn't feel right? Can you praise God even when you don't feel God's blessing upon you? Can you praise God when the night is the darkest, when the storm is the most powerful? Can you praise God when you don't have everything that you wanted in the first place? Better yet, can you praise God when he's cursing you? Because that's what Satan asks. 
He says, would you allow me to take everything away? Would you curse Job? If you would do that, listen, Job would turn away immediately. I understand tonight that few have ever existed who could answer in the affirmative to that latter question, and Satan was banking on it. He was banking because he didn't know Job the way God knew Job. He was banking on the fact that if Job lost everything, if God would take away everything from him, then Job would stop being the upright and righteous man that he had always been. Surely if God traded blessings for sorrow, Job would turn away from him immediately. The most interesting part is the language our adversary uses in these verses. I did not notice this for some time in my ministry, but it's very important. I want you to notice that Satan says... But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. Satan did not ask for permission from God to strike Job himself. Instead, he told God to stretch out his own hand against his servant. Hang on to that thought. We're going to come back to it in a few moments. In verse 12, it says, uh, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. In other words, what God did was in that moment he gave permission for Satan to strike against Job, but he also gave a promise. He said, there is a limit to what you can do. Satan, you can move in this man's life, but you cannot move in such a way that you would affect his health. You can do anything else you want, but do not touch his health. There's a great promise there, beloved. Don't be deceived, don't be discouraged at what you're reading. Yes, it's a little bit discouraging to see that God would allow the adversary to move in Job's life, give him permission to do so, but there's a great promise because God said there is a limit to what I will allow you to do. Satan is on that leash. I will allow you to do this much, but no more, right? I think that's interesting. story unfolds. Job loses his property and his children. And listen to his response. Then it says, Then Job arose and he tore his robe and he shaved his head. And he fell on the ground and, listen, I like this word, it's underlined in my Bible, and he worshipped. When Satan, by the permission of God, struck Job and took away his children, his properties, his bank account, his immediate reaction was to repent in dust and sackcloth and ashes, to shave his head, And to turn to God and to worship. And how did he worship? It says, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. Listen to this. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, the writer says, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. When Job lost all that he had, he did something spectacular, even unimaginable. He worshiped the Lord. What kind of faith does it take? To worship God in the midst of suffering. That's the kind of faith that I want. Perhaps you're thinking Job didn't know that God was involved. He didn't, right? He didn't. You told us that he didn't understand the heavenly scene. Maybe he didn't know that Satan was involved or else he would have said, Satan has taken away. But I want you to notice that his lack of knowledge does not change his assessment. He sings the very first worship song, which is, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even though he didn't understand the spiritual battle that was taking place, he said, God has given to me and God has taken away. And the writer concludes that Job was not wrong in saying that. Let me make a a very personal, practical application God took a 62-year-old grandfather from the world. God took a 20-month-old baby from the world. God took a 20-week-old baby from the womb. Did I offend you in that? Because that is exactly what Job says in this moment. God has given, and now God has taken away. And the writer says, and he was spot on when he said it. He was right. He was right. What does that mean, beloved? It means that God is ruling and reigning in his creation, actively involved, even, are you ready, in the very worst of situations. Job didn't accuse the devil, though I'm sure it crossed his mind. Job didn't accuse Mother Nature or the hoarding neighbors, though I'm sure it was difficult not to find resentment for them. 
He said that his life was in his maker's hands, and it was his to do with it as he saw fit. Job's responsibility, he's saying in this moment, is simply to worship, despite my inability to see what's going on. When Job blamed God for his loss, did you notice the Bible says, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Is there a way that we can understand God is active, ruling and reigning in his creation, even in the most difficult of circumstances, and not charge God with unholiness, unrighteousness, not charge God with wrong? Apparently, Job found that way. Even though Job knew that God was in charge, he did not call God unjust. Job didn't accuse God of handling the situation wrong. He said, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, oh man, do I wish we could keep going. Because I hate leaving you at this moment. Because what a powerful truth just got uncovered. And yet for a week, you're going to have to stop and think about it. (laughs) You're going to have to struggle and wrestle with just how sovereign, how great, how powerful God really is. If I can, but for a moment, skip ahead, I can say, I want to say this, that God is ruling and reigning in his creation intimately and actively, and that indeed is our very hope tonight. Because if God is not active in creation, our prayers are pointless. He has no control over them. I wish the story could stop there, but it doesn't. In chapter 2, the story gets repeated, and Satan comes before God and asks for more permission. God this time allows Satan to attack Job's health. The rest of the story is about Job wrestling with God and how I wish... We had time to discuss it at length. But I hope at this point tonight you're beginning to ask a question. What type of God could strike his servant who loved him? We could look at countless passages of scripture on God's providence and suffering. For example, Amos chapter 3 and verse 6. This one will blow your mind. If a trumpet is blown in a city and the people are not afraid, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Ooh. Did you hear that? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? How can we believe that God rules and reigns over his creation? That he's intimately and actively involved, but not charge him with wrong? Well, tune in next week and we'll finish Job's story. (laughs) How about that? Because it's 7.07 p.m. and my teleprompter is blinking at me saying it is time for you to go home. Think on these things. Consider these things. How, oh how, can we believe that God is sovereign but not charge him with injustice in the midst of pain? How can the prophet say that a disaster happens in a city and the Lord has caused it and God not be unrighteous? When you answer that question, you'll begin to see the winding road of providence begin to straighten out a little bit. Because you will see that God has purpose, even in the most difficult situations of life. I had planned to go a lot further, but we're not going to get to it tonight. I hope you'll come back next week and we'll finish this discussion. All right? Let's have a word of prayer and we will be dismissed. Father,